Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, please let's settle down uh, because we are about to start. Uh, you're ready? Okay. okay. I think we just start so that we, in the interest of time. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone. I hope that our online participants can see us and they can hear us. Uh, I want to welcome you to this session on the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. Uh, the acronym is DF, uh, DFI. What is it about? What does it do? Um, so this session, as a way of introduction, um, the IGF 2021 messages, particularly those on the topics of economic and social inclusion and human rights, have some influence on this session. Others are universal access and meaningful connectivity trust, security and stability, and inclusive internet governance ecosystems and digital cooperation. The session's goal is to start a multi-stakeholder conversation about how to promote digital inclusion, accomplish sustainable development, and maintain an open, global, interoperable, and secure internet. Additionally, this calls for ensuring that everyone has meaningful and ongoing access to the internet and preserving its openness to support democracy and human rights. In keeping uh, with this, this session hopes to cover open internet policies and initiatives that are crucial to promoting reliability, stability, and interoperability of the internet, including a human-centric strategy. All of this cannot be accomplished without taking into account the resilience of the internet governance ecosystem, which depends on organized coordination and consolidation among the various stakeholders to support a promising future for the internet. Specifically in this session, we are going to be answering how do we ensure that the internet remains open, global, and uh, interoperable in line with universal values and fundamental rights? And two, how can governments, private entities, civil society, and the technical community translate the principles of the Declaration for the Future of Internet into concrete policies and actions and work together to promote uh, this vision? Uh, with me, um, I have four panelists and um, I start uh, on my left, uh, and I hope I'll be pronouncing correctly. If I don't, uh, you'll, you'll correct it when you speak. And that's past Donahue, uh, the director on Future Networks and DG Connect, uh, who is participating in person. Uh, on my right, um, I have uh, Miss Henriette. Uh, do you know, you, Andrita, I, I have never tried to pronounce your second name. <laughs> All these years I have known you. All these years. Yes. Andrit, uh, Executive Director. Um, um, I see you're still listed as an uh, Executive Director. Executive. I know you are not Executive. I know you are. But you're an associate of the Association for Progressive Communications, APC. And uh, are you still the MAG Chair? No. Former MAG Chair. 
uh, who is also participating in person. Uh, to join us uh, virtually, we have Mr. Tim Wong, who is a special assistant to the President for Technology and Competition Policy, National Economic Council at the White House. And then we have uh, Ms. Mariette Shake, who is the International Policy Director at the Cyber Policy Center at the Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, uh, Stanford University. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we, are ho we hope to have a very um, exciting and um, useful conversation. We have our online moderator also, and that's uh, Ms. Sonia Toro, who will be guiding us on questions that are coming online. And so straight away, I would like to go uh, into the question. And the first question I'm fielding uh, to you, uh, Mr. Donahue. Now, the Declaration for the Future of Internet uh, reclaims the promise of the internet vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ongoing global opportunities and challenges and lays out uh, important standards for achieving a free, open, and human rights uh, protecting internet. Now, how can governments, the private sector, civil society, and technical community translate these principles uh, of the Declaration of the Future of Internet into concrete policies and actions and work together to promote um, this vision uh, globally and you have uh, try and uh, speak maybe seven minutes um. thank you grace and uh, good afternoon or whatever time it is for those of you who are online a great a stab at uh, my name, Pierce O'Donoghue. But isn't that great that uh, this is one of the, the, the riches of the internet that we all get to learn about uh, how we spell names? And I'm sure that'll be one of the last things that any AI algorithm will be able to do is to, is, is to, is to replace that particular skill. So um, in relation to your question, it's those kind of human elements that uh, reinforce the principles and the strategies that uh, in the European Union and with... Um, uh, like-minded partners across the world that we in recognizing the power of the internet as a tool we also have to recognize the challenges um, uh, and as a great thought leader who is now back to the forefront of our work here uh, Vin Cerf has commented several times when the internet was designed it was assumed that everybody who was participating really wanted it to work and really wanted it to be an open communications platform uh, and of course we moved on now to a situation where that might no longer be the case uh, and of course our governance has to take uh, uh, account of that so we felt it was really important to reflect on the challenges uh, as well of course as uh, reinforcing our objective in bringing the internet to everybody and to ensuring that it is a safe and uh, importantly an open uh, environment for uh, personal, cultural and economic development. Uh, and we have to work together to make these happen. So, so in that context, to make the internet a trustworthy place, some of the questions that you asked me, Grace, are things that members of the IGF community here and online will say, but we've already done that work. And it is true that in the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, I hope that there is nothing there that the multi-stakeholder community will not recognize. The point that uh, we have seen, for example, when in a few years ago we were talking about some of the, the operational weaknesses of the IGF, was that we saw a lack of commitment by certain communities. Uh, for example, we had governments who came, made speeches and left. Uh, and we had a waning of, of involvement or interest from, from business and the commercial community. Uh, and, and the declaration was an attempt to address the principles which are already common currency of the multi-stakeholder community here in a way that would allow governments who also have a role to play to sign up to those principles. In, in some cases stating that there are things that they will not do as opposed to things that they will do in order to ensure that the internet is and remains an open, interoperable, trusted space which respects the individual, including their integrity, physical and online, their per personal data, uh, as well as their identity. And also then, that we, in having those principles uh, uh, manifesting themselves in an operational way, we can allow and ensure that access ava is available to everyone that all citizens as well as businesses can trust that they are safe online, uh, that their data is secure uh, and that their transaction is privileged. 
So that will re give rise, that trusted environment will give rise to further re uh, innovation. Uh, and of course, it means that the, uh, the data economy can thrive uh, and it can be something to which individuals can uh, place their trust. So that's the background uh, of, of the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. Already we have nearly uh, 70 partner countries who have stood behind this uh, affirmative agenda for the Internet. And following its launch in April, we're now focusing on bridging the gap with other uh, uh, countries, um, trying to ensure that the principles and their concrete implementation uh, are seamless and transparent. And now, and some of you will say maybe it's a bit late, but to ensure that the multi-stakeholder community have a crucial and leading role in doing this. And that is why, as well as the consultations on the principles in the Declaration, we organized, for example, just a month ago in Prague and the Czech Republic, uh, a conference uh, on this, and we organized four specific workshops uh, for the multi-stakeholder community in order to reflect on these principles, in order to instruct and inform the, 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 the target signatories about how important this is, addressing um, growing threats such as threats of internet shutdowns, uh, and of course looking at how do we build cybersecurity and trust, uh, and how do we build skills so that all internet users have the ability to navigate and use it to its full. So these are issues which no one party, including the governments who would be signatories, could address or solve alone. And again, many of the paths that have been identified have already been identified here. So we have to ensure that we can, in an operational way, bring governments into that discussion to show them all the work that the community has done, but also bring that work to where the discussions currently are forming, for example, in relation to the Global Digital Compact, so that the input of this community, of these communities, will play a central role with regard to the shaping of the future internet governance environment, not least, of course, the digital compact itself, but also then work on WISIS, etc. So, we are aware of certain criticism with regard to the, 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 the relationship between the DFI and the IGF. For us, there is no contradiction simply because our commitment is first and foremost to the IGF and the principles which it stands for. We see the DFI as a very necessary and useful manifestation or expression of the principles to which the IGF has spent its entire 20 years uh, constructing and also uh, uh, has shown that it has the ability to adapt itself to address the questions of the day in order to ensure that in the future not only is the multi-stakeholder community, but the Internet Governance Forum, which you have all invested so much in, will continue to play, and in fact, an increasing central role with regard to the governance of the Internet. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, uh, <clears throat> uh, Pass, for that uh, very well articulated uh, introduction into the principles. Um, Mr. Tim uh, Wong, are you there? Um, can you hear us? I had been told he was having challenges, but uh, okay. Uh, can the technical? Uh, ah, there you go. So you said uh, thank you very much. Okay. It said uh, that uh, you have to unmute me, so it looks like you have. All right. How are you? <laughs> All right, now, I, 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 this question is for you. The, the declaration for the, f uh, for, for the future of Internet calls uh, for protection and strengthening of a multi-stakeholder system of Internet governance. How is the declaration for the future um, um, in line with multi-stakeholder Internet governance model? which is driven by organizations and forums such as the IGF. And uh, how can the DFI signatories uh, work on taking further the principle of multi-stakeholderism? And you have, um, we'd appreciate seven minutes. Thank you. I appreciate that and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. As I was said in the introduction, I think, um, it, you know, being in, in close collaboration with a multi-stakeholder process is very important to every uh, goal that uh, the United States has. 
and also uh, the goals of the Declaration uh, for the Future of, of the Internet. So let me uh, uh, give a sense of, uh, of some of the thinking uh, behind, behind this. Uh, as uh, I think people uh, in this room know, uh, the reason uh, that the uh, Declaration of the Future of the Internet uh, came to be uh, conceived of and signed was a as a response to uh, alarming and concerning um, patterns of state behavior. And its um, you know, general goal is to set uh, basic norms, restate basic principles, which I think many people have long thought uh, taken for granted as to how uh, nation states should uh, comport themselves with respect to the internet and, uh, and set down in what could be considered in some respects a almost constitutional type of norms for state uh, behavior. Um, and one of those, and I think a very important one, was to have uh, respect for the uh, multi-stakeholder governance processes. The internet, uh, its uh, original and founding strengths was that it wasn't, um, you know, uh, in any sense uh, controlled by, by a single uh, country. It wasn't subject to the whims of, of a single sovereign, but rather um, was uh, the, uh, driven and, and uh, managed by the internet community. And that has been a system which has worked extraordinarily well when you think about uh, the many decades that have already passed. And so among the uh, concerns that, that uh, the drafters of the declaration had uh, was that uh, nation states may become, uh, might seek to increase their power or increase their um, uh, their uh, leverage at the expense of the uh, multi-stakeholder governance uh, process and, you know, particularly the technical uh, sides of it. So, uh, in some sense, there's a uh, effort here by the, uh, the, the states, nation states that are coming together to sign the declaration to, to say that there needs to be respect for, for multi-stakeholder processes and particularly multi-stakeholder technical governance. And, um, you know, it's funny, it might seem to some people, well, why would states have to say that? But I think it, it is because states are the ones who are binding themselves and saying we're not going to interfere with these processes. So, uh, as I said, I, I, I think that goes back to the purpose of this declaration and why, you know, now, um, you know, some people have said, well, don't we already have all these norms in place? And I think one of the uh, most important uh, objects of the, of the declaration is to address what, um, you know, over the years have become something of a, of a gap. Uh, there have always been very strong norms surrounding the internet. Um, you know, that is part of much of what it gives its strength. Uh, just to take an example, the, the norms that um, uh, the, the inf infrastructure provider should uh, faithfully carry content is a longstanding one. Um, and uh, it's part of the success of the internet. And, you know, for a very long time was not uh, any sort of legal obligation. Um, originally, the internet also had uh, norms surrounding commerce and so forth, but there have not been uh, in the tradition um, uh, uh, st uh, norms that were very clearly binding on states. And I, I just wanted to point out that this is why I think, and, you know, some people say, well, why is the declaration only um, states as members and why is it so state focused? I think because it, the idea is to address a gap in um, and, and what had appeared to the drafters is a growing problem, which is, as I said before, the problem of state behavior. So, you know, I think I've hopefully made this point clear. The purpose and the goal of the declaration with respect to multi-stateholder governance processes is to bind states to respect them and not to uh, interfere. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tim. Um, Andriette, you have been in this process, so you have listened to teams very well articulated uh, uh, points and especially the last point about why the declaration is important in light of what the government, uh, you know, government must commit to. Um, so as you respond to that, uh, there's also the question of, you know, uh, that the declaration points out to urgent uh, technology issues that need to be addressed, especially when we look at the Ukraine, uh, what has been happening uh, in, in Ukraine, and equally to different human needs that um, require this generation to step forward and act collectively to protect human rights on the internet. So how can we ensure that the internet remains open, 
global interoperable in line with universal values and fundamental rights. Anrit? Thank you very much, Grace. Um, and thanks to Tim for being back at the IGF. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but Tim also participated in a session on the declaration at the 2021 um, IGF. Um, I mean, firstly, I think we need to recognize, and I think you'll find this in the text of the declaration, that the internet might be interoperable, but it's not open and it's not global. Um, there are many people who still do not have access to it or do have access um, that are constrained or that is constrained by, among other things, state behavior, such as internet shutdowns or, or limitations on, on freedom of information and expression. So I think having, that having this as a goal and striving for an open and inclusive um, internet that, that respects fundamental rights is absolutely important. And I think I really value that the, the declaration emphasizes that, and I think it has very strong content. I particularly, I, I particularly like the concept in the declaration of reclaiming the potential of the internet, because I think, for me, I find it very meaningful, because I think we, we've, in a sense, lost touch with that potential, particularly that potential of the internet as a public um, good, to use a controversial term, and I'm not saying that's in the declaration. I think what concerns me is that I think if we use our aspiration for, for building an inclusive, rights-respecting, open internet and, and utilizing its potential for economic and social development, we need to do that inclusively. And I think there's a concept in the declaration of like-minded actors or like-minded states. And I feel the moment that we start using these very positive pro-rights principles to create ultimatums or criteria or dividers for being, are you with us? And if you're not with us, does that mean you're against us? I think then we are straying from the path of inclusive dialogue. And I think the only way in which we can enhance and strengthen the global open internet um, based on human rights and, and fundamental values of, of, of social justice and inclusion, whatever is meaningful to you, whether it's in an international treaty or, or something that's valued at a slightly different cultural level. If we don't do that inclusively, we're not going to achieve that goal. Um, if we make the internet a political football in, in terms of global geopolitical tension and, and, and conflict, we, we, we then ha you know, harming the internet or, or, or reducing the internet's potential as a platform for, for building peace. So um, you know, I, I would like to see the declaration be a starting point rather than an end point. I think it's a strong document. I believe, I agree with Tim, I think there is a gap in asking states to commit um, to certain um, normative behavior. Um, but, but you have to build that bottom up. I think it's no accident. I think there are two African states that have signed on to the declaration. According to the website, there might be more. And I think for many states in the global south, um, it, it concerns them that, that, that documents are prepared by others and then they are asked to come to the table after the fact and sign on. You know, that is not the kind of process that we need. It might be much harder to build a, a declaration and a common, to, a common normative framework uh, inclusively and collectively and it might take much more time. But if we don't do that, we're not actually going to, to, to change the status quo, um, which is where the global open rights respecting internet is something that has potential that, that we want to aspire to, but we don't yet have it. Uh, thanks, Henriette. Wow, uh, very well articulated. Um, I don't know if our fourth speaker is online. Uh, is um, Marietta online? She's okay. Okay. Now, uh, the declaration acknowledges uh, the surge in uh, cyber attacks, uh, which brings some risks to the current in internet architecture. Uh, what is the role of multi stakeholder community in addressing this challenge in order to avoid um, the fragmentation of the internet? And again, uh, Marike, you have about seven minutes. Thank you.
she, she, Hi everyone. She... Sorry, I know that you can probably hear me, but maybe not see me. But I don't have a uh, moderator authority to unmute my camera. So I'm waving at you virtually then, I guess. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Marika. And, and, and uh, the, uh, I'm being told that you can actually, uh, you, you can actually use your camera. Yes, it's starting now. Okay, wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, I wish I could be there with you in, uh, in uh, Addis to have all the uh, wonderful discussions and uh, information sessions live. But uh, without that opportunity, I'm happy to join you virtually. I wanted to say a few things generally about the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, about the multi-stakeholder model, and then end with some thoughts on the very specific topic of security. But I think it's impossible to see uh, anything related to the future of the internet in a silo. So security matters bleed into rights matters, bleed into economic matters, and uh, we find ourselves at a particularly vulnerable geopolitical moment in time. So uh, I think it's important to see the connections between those different aspects that are all very important. Now, a few words on the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, and I want to compliment Tim for the work he's done uh, in the US and uh, all the partners, including the European Union uh, and the many other governments that have signed up. Uh, and I understand those that wonder, why do we need another declaration? And at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge the significance of a return to first principles at this moment in time, because so much has changed in how the internet is not only understood by governments, for example, uh, but also the role that the internet has taken as a growing um, vital critical infrastructure for our economies, our societies, our education. Just think about where we would have been during the pandemic without the internet. But also the way in which the internet is increasingly considered as an instrument of power uh, by both governments that have sought to shut it down uh, in, uh, in Ethiopia, for example, but also in other, uh, in other countries, and the way in which it is being instrumentalized uh, for economic benefits, but also, uh, as said, for, for political power plays. Think about all the disinformation campaigns that have gone, gone on over the internet uh, and the temptation to uh, go deeper and deeper into the protocols of the internet to wage power battles. And so I think we find ourselves at a moment in time where even if we would love for that to be true, the internet de facto is no longer truly global or truly open in practice. And certainly the trend is going in the direction of more national control, uh, more top-down control, and more uh, instrumentalizing towards political power, towards um, silencing critics, uh, and towards making it difficult to uphold the promise of an open internet. And so that's why uh, it's important to realize how much we assumed the internet would bring positive change, an inclusive debate, uh, empowerment of individuals, a voice for the voiceless, uh, and an opportunity to document and share human rights abuses, and really for the internet to be an emancipatory force. We all hoped it, I think. Uh, there were hopeful signs and promising movements and moments in time, but I do think it's important to state the principles that we cherish and to see buy-in from governments. Uh, and that's why I think the declaration can add value. But as with many multi-stakeholder processes, uh, many declarations of principle, it is important that it doesn't become too much of a distraction. So in a good case, yes, a multi-stakeholder process and a declaration like this uh, refocuses the attention, make sure that there are different people at the table, particularly civil society organizations and particularly those from the majority world or the global south. Uh, that is a, an optimistic way in which the multi-stakeholder process can facilitate change. Uh, additionally, when there is a commitment by democratic governments and their allies, to make sure that principles are implemented and translated into policies, new collaborations across borders, coalitions, as well as accountability processes, then I think the multi-stakeholder model can work well. But in its worst case, it allows parties, governments, but also uh, companies, for example, to be non-committal, to sign up to declarations, to state principles once more, but not to truly change their actions. 
And in the worst case, it can also be a distraction from the needed regulations, for example, by democratic governments that are happy to support declarations with statements, but that were perhaps not as keen to do their own homework. And when I read the declaration, I can actually imagine a long wish list of steps to be taken by a number of governments, but I think the US government is one important one, for example, to rein in corporate power and the harms that they are causing, the uh, excessive power in the hands of, of private companies uh, to the internet uh, as one example. Um, then um, a couple more thoughts on the growing role of private companies. I believe there's a task for all of us, particularly those of you who are at the IGF and who have worked uh, in multi-stakeholder processes for a long time. I hope that there can be a sort of next version of the multi-stakeholder model as well, because there's a risk that those stakeholders at the table are not necessarily proportionally represented, that uh, relatively uh, small voices, uh, minor organizations, are up against huge, wealthy, billion-dollar companies under the big umbrella of a multi-stakeholder model. But I think with big power should come a big responsibility, and I think it's important to give that more depth to show how different stakeholders each play their role and should each be held to account for that role. Another challenge tends to be to focus very much on process. Yes, a multi-stakeholder process, and I think it can be very valuable. I, I believe democracy is a multi-stakeholder process. But when we're not explicit about the values upon which a governance model is then built, a multi-stakeholder model can take us all kinds of different directions. There can be confusion about whether we truly share the values that we are uh, um, um, seeking governance um, to be based on and whether or not those should be made a little bit more explicit. And then ultimately, uh, and I think it's been said by Pierce as well, uh, when there is a, uh, a lack of uh, clarity, there can also be a lack of accountability, a lack of results, uh, and a lack of holding, holding up uh, the standards that have been decided. Now, taking all of this uh, together, the, the need for um, anchoring in those first principles and to take the next step with the multi-stakeholder model, I think we can learn similar, similar lessons with regard to cybersecurity in particular, because um, there are a couple of trends that I think are worrying, and, and then I'll stop. One is, of course, the fact that we see companies increasingly on the front line of could be battlefields in, in war, uh, could be um, during peacetime, but still dealing with uh, attacks and conflict. Questions of who is responsible and who gets to see who is responsible for those attacks are often in the hands of private companies. And that is a huge shift. I cannot underline enough how much of a shift that is from where we came from when there was no digitization, where there were kinetic attacks, uh, unfortunately, but not cyber attacks, um, as we see today and as we see blending in uh, with any modern day conflict and um, intensification of competition sometimes as well. And it is important that there's clarity on which role which stakeholder plays. Uh, the fact that actually there should be uh, a mandate to use force, for example, and there should be oversight, checks and balances over the use of force, as well as accountability for uh, what has been done in the name of citizens. And I do believe that when we see too much of a privatization uh, without the said accountability and oversight, we have a slippery slope away from principles uh, that are enshrined in international law, for example, and we can uh, see how... Okay. Uh, I will yes? ask you to summarize uh, because of time. Okay, well, I'm finished. I can leave it here, actually. Uh, just to say that uh, it's important that different stakeholders are held to account for the role that they play and that we do not... Uh, in the name of, a, uh, of an inclusive process of everyone at the table, let different stakeholders get away with an outsized uh, use of power without checks on that power. And I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, at this point, I want to bring it back to the floor for questions, for interventions. And I will ask you to introduce yourself 
um, yes. and then uh, raise uh, your question. So I'm going to take uh, five questions, and then uh, and then uh, we can um, we can bring it back to the panelists uh, to respond. Um, then we have uh, online participation, so I'll expect uh, for those who want to participate uh, to ask questions online, uh, and you are uh, following us from Zoom, uh, pre uh, please raise your hand so that you can be uh, the, our online moderator can actually uh, attention uh, us on, on, on who wants to ask. So we'll start this way, uh, Wolfgang, uh, number two. Uh, my site, there is no hand from there. And then uh, <laughs> number three. Anyone else? Okay. All right. So we'll do those three. And then uh, we'll see if we have others um, online. And we'll bring it back to the panelists. Wolfgang, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a retired professor from the University of Aarhus. If I would have to evaluate the declaration, I would say uh, substance A plus, but procedure B minus, or let's say a C. So the substance is really wonderful. And I can only agree with Tim and also with Piers, uh, while nothing new is in the declaration, there is really an urgent need to reiterate what we have achieved the last 20, 30 years. The dreams of the founding fathers of the internet, internet freedom, cyber democracy, are under big pressure and has to be saved in the future of the internet. So uh, I think this is undoubtedly, and in so far, this is a great document and uh, also uh, the, the specificity of the principles is extremely useful. Procedurally, I think B minus or uh, C, why the hell the US government, which always supported a bottom up policy development approach, private sector leadership, and multi stakeholder reason, came with a top down government-led initiative and excluded the stakeholders from the making of this declaration. I think Andretta has made the point and said, you know, what I call the Budapest cybercrime convention effect. So you cannot expect that if you negotiate a document in an isolated way, that then other will take uh, w what is on the plate and say, you know, wonderful, uh, if, if they are excluded from the making of a document. So this is uh, a, a missed opportunity and uh, I fully agree with Piers when he said we have to look forward now. And in so far, it's very good if the European Commission supports or started now a series of uh, mighty stakeholder workshops, so to include them. And uh, But the first thing in Prague was also rather uh, intransparent, was also a little bit top down. There was no public call. Uh, or a, a discussion what, uh, about the themes at its family in the IGF and, uh, environment. So I have two proposals. Uh, one is um, establish a mighty stakeholder program committee for the implementation of the uh, declaration and where they select then themes and uh, uh, other probably projects. And you can use all the national and regional IGFs. The next opportunity is the Eurotic and Tampere in, 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 in June next year. So I think this would be a process because the issues which are raised by the declaration will not go away. And the second proposal is open the door for signature of non-state actors. Beers has said, you know, uh, we have a lack of commitment of governments, but we have also a lack of commitment of big corporations. The Paris call on uh, cybersecurity has opened the door for signatures by uh, non-state actors. And it would be extremely useful if big private companies would uh, commit themselves uh, to the principles of the declaration. But so far, there is no procedure in place. So you, as a all the civil society organization, you uh, have no way uh, how to sign the document. So th repair these procedural weaknesses. Thank you. My name is Mwendwa Kivuva from Kiktanet, and Wolfgang has preempted some of the questions I wanted to ask, but probably still on, parti on participation. Is multi-stakeholderism the only way to develop documents? Uh, 
is multi-stakeholderism and impediment to those who want to run a sprint. Probably some people want to run very fast and others want to run a marathon. Are we running the same races? Is, this, is the people who run 100 meters and the people who are running marathons are on two different races? And can teams who deeply believe in something go ahead and develop a declaration and then look for allies? If you develop a document and you're able to bring more allies to support it, is, it, is that still a method that is accepted? And probably, Henriette, I will want you to look at this question because you had touched on it. And then to peers, has any of the principles been challenged? And can there be a process to edit part of the document and probably go back and bring more stakeholders on board, as Wolfgang is trying to suggest in his suggestions. And if you have explained all the criticism, peers, there's a criticism that you explained that you had talked about that people have raised. If you have explained this criticism to governments, for example, why are they still not signing to the document if the criticism made sense to them? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aisam Bozlur Rahman. I am working with uh, Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum. Uh, basically, one year ago, uh, the declaration for the future of the internet, DFI, came out, but still we are waiting for the plan of action. Of course, uh, DFI has create a, created lots of reactions in line with negative and positive. Now, this moment, we are discussing the declaration for the future of the internet in the 17th IGF after one year without any plan of action. Therefore, we would like to know when the plan of action will announce. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, three online uh, questions. Uh, can uh, wait, can Andrew Kampling be unmuted? Uh, to ask the question. Hello. Hi, hopefully uh, you can hear me okay. Um, yes, we can hear uh, you. Yeah, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> yes, so th thank you for the uh, uh, discussion so so far. Um, I, I think the Declaration on the Future of the Internet is a is a really important document, um, uh, not least because it provides a, a basis for alternate alternative vision uh, for the future of the Internet to that offered by, for example, the proponents of uh, new IP. So it was uh, much needed um, to provide that alternative vi uh, vision. Uh, in, in my view, though, perhaps in agreement with some of the other people that have commented, um, uh, it really uh, uh, now needs, uh, uh, now that it's got momentum, it, it needs to be adopted by the wider stakeholder community, uh, both by opening up to non-governmental um, signatories, as uh, others uh, have mentioned, um, and by other parts of the multi-stakeholder community, um, uh, such as uh, ICANN, the ITF, maybe even the ITU, uh, etc., taking the key principles into their respective processes. Um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, on, on the back of that, a mechanism for subsequently updating the declaration through a consensus process um, would then be beneficial. Uh, and I'd be interested to know if uh, the panel members uh, agree with those points. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, can the microphone also be unmuted now for Mokaberi? Hello, can, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I should thank you for organizing this timely session. Uh, my question is to Mr. Uh, Tim Wu. Uh, uh, what is the relation between the vision is uh, presented uh, excuse me. Uh, what is the relation between the
the vision is presented in the Declaration for Future of Internet, and the vision is presented in the recent report of CFR, Council of Foreign Relations, entitled Confronting Reality in Cyberspace, Foreign Policy for Fragmented Internet. This report concludes that the era of the one global internet is over. It seems that these two visions are somehow contradictory. Uh, could you explain, uh, could you please explain more about its impact and the potential, potential contribution of declaration for future of the internet on facilitation of internet fragmentation at the political level? And uh, it could be a policy of excluding other countries from different layer of the internet. Uh, does it lead to coalition like internet? Uh, uh, now, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to write my uh, concern. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Your point is noted. And finally, our last um, uh, question from online, and that's from Izan Khan. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the discussion, uh, you know, uh, that we've had from the panel so far. Uh, one of the questions that I had, more of an observation, really, uh, that pertains to the declaration is we don't see, uh, for example, members of very important uh, geopolitical sort of centers, such as BRICS, as signatories of the declaration. And more importantly, the signatories that do exist, um, uh, the democratic nations and other nations who are considered to be the digital deciders, themselves have certain kinds of policies that if implemented from those kinds of countries, uh, we would consider them to be you know, absolutely abhorrent. So things like extraterritorial requirements to take down content uh, or you know, surveillance uh, sort of laws that, that would exist. And so these countries that we would usually want to try uh, to bring towards the side of uh, you know, internet freedom and greater digital rights uh, would basically, you know, you'd end up with a situation of the pot calling the kettle black, essentially. So what kind of diplomacy would be required to bring these sort of countries also on board and share the vision in light of all of these observations? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all those questions. I think there are some questions that are uh, directly addressed to certain speakers. I know there are some that are addressed to to peers, especially the one from uh, Wolfgang uh, on, 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 on the process, uh, scoring a C, uh, or is it a B minus, and uh, the need to establish a multi-stakeholder implementation. There is a question actually for Henriette, uh, you know, is multi-stakeholderism the only approach to develop uh, internet documents? Um, there is a, a, a peers, there is also another one, has the process been challenged? Uh, there's one for team uh, on um, internet fragmentation and the relationship with other players. And finally, there are other two questions that uh, can be picked by any of the speakers, uh, and that's on the, you know, the important signatories missing in the declaration, as well as what is the plan of action. Uh, I think we'll start this time. Let's start with you, Henriette. Then we'll come uh, to Piers, and then we'll go to the online uh, uh, panelist. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, um, um, Grace, and um, thanks, everyone, for, for the questions. I, I want to quickly just comment on, on Wolfgang's proposal, um, which I think is a great proposal to get more conversation, more more buy-in on the declaration, the idea of using the Internet Governance Forum and its NRIs to, to discuss and, and, and talk about um, the declaration. Um, but I also think we need to use the international system. I think we already saw with, um, with the Net Mondial where we generated an incredibly powerful, useful, simple <laughs> document in 2014 um, using a multi-stakeholder process, but it it just never quite went into the multilateral space, and therefore it never went any further. And I think this is the challenge of us in, in thinking, and Maritia pointed to this, how do we modify, how do we adapt the multi-stakeholder approach? Um, and I think one of the, the mechanisms that we need to build into this multi-stakeholder approach is better articulation.
articulation with the multilateral um, uh, system. And particularly when it comes to issues of peace and security, we need a strong, trusted United Nations system. And, and if we don't use it, and if we don't challenge it, where it falls short, we're never going to have it. And Linda, I think, no, the multi-stakeholder approach is obviously not the only approach. I think we also need to, I'm not even sure if we still say the multi-stakeholder approach. And I think Maricha, I hope she elaborates on that because I think she did flag that. It is an approach, it's an approach that needs to be critiqued, adapted, developed, it, it's applied differently in different contexts. But as for your question, and can we no longer generate documents and then ask others to, to sign on to them? My response would be yes, if you just want them, them to express general agreement, that's fine. But if you want them to comply with it and to live it and hold others accountable for complying with it, no, then you can't. They actually have to feel ownership of it. They have to understand what the implications are for them as a state, what the implications are for them in terms of how they are holding other actors accountable. I'd like to see the U.S. use the declaration as a framework for holding U.S. corporations accountable. That to me would demonstrate how seriously the U.S. has thought about the contents of this declaration. And I think that, I hope, is the intention. Um, so then, on, on, you know, just on the, on the uh, sort of general other point about BRICS, I, I think, Isan, it's a very important point. And, and I think that you can see that when you look at the signatories at the moment. It does not contain those countries. And I think that is significant. And I think that if we really want to have impact, and we, we have to work, multi-stakeholder processes are messy, as Fiona Alexander said in, in the chat. The IHANA process was quite messy, the transition process. It took a long time. But if we don't work through those disagreements, if we don't try and establish common ground, um, then we're not going to actually have effective global governance um, of the internet. Okay, Piers. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I too will, will, will try to address some of the questions that were put to me directly. But I wanted to start by way of doing so by actually responding also to one point that Annie had made in her first comments, which was quite uh, quite a um, you know a, 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 a stark uh, point with regard to the need to do this process inclusively and and, and the risk uh, that if somehow we said you either agree with us or you don't, that's not inclusive. Um, certainly, uh, that that risk existed. But what I want to go back to is just to to, to recall that of course what we have is a set of principles. Uh, and what we are saying is, you are a like-minded country, will you sign? But can you, as a government, agree to these principles? And what's more, will you publicly commit to implementing them? Uh, and so uh, we were fa faced with somewhat of a dilemma that if we went into a detailed um, uh, and inclusive process, such as we are used to in the multi-stakeholder environment, then we had also the risk of it being uh, watered down or becoming a political football, as you yourself said, in that process, and we would have ended up with a document which had less value. So, 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 so of course, it's a dilemma. It, it, it's not a perfect solution, which I have to say. Um, and then that helps me then to answer uh, the, the questions that were put, particularly with regard uh, to Wolfgang um, uh, on the process. Well, we'll take that hit. Y the process was not, I, I think by definition, perhaps could not have been um, perfect. But in now working, and when I mentioned the four workshops, multi-stakeholder workshops, uh, it is our ambition that there will be many more. I, I hear what you're saying, and thank you, it's, it's a very good pointer uh, as to how we should build on that to make it even more important. And I would just like to recall to everybody, in what is a short document, it is not a coincidence that the last paragraph of this document, which is the conclusion and the way forward, points explicitly without uh, any um, uh, ambiguity to the multi-stakeholder process, to the role it plays and to the commitment of every single signatory to the declaration that we will work with and form partnerships with those communities. And that is the going forward part that I hope that you will all uh, help us with. The other point I would make, and again, I, I hope I'm not seen as just making excuses, but, but it, there were considerations. 
we deliberately wanted the text to be light. So the last thing we want to do is to create new structures because they would have been seen as being in opposition to, in competition with, or uh, in some way cutting across the focus and the energies which we have and want to preserve and in fact increase in the IGF, in its intercessional work, uh, and in the inputs from all of these communities into, for example, the digital compact, etc. So by being deliberately light mm -hmm. on process, we of course ran into the, 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 the obvious criticism about the weaknesses in that process, but where we can learn. And the last point I would make is, yes, uh, we have nearly 70 signatories. Uh, it is interesting sometimes, as has been commented here, to look at who is not there. But we are still in contacts uh, with a number of countries and hoping that an increasing number of signatories will engage in those discussions to see if we can bring on board many more. But then that brings me to what was said by Wolfgang, but also by, by, by Andrew, uh, uh, with regard to the mechanisms for updating, opening it up to other parties, etc. The fact is, as I said, I pointed to the last paragraph, there is a critical role that is already there for the multi-stakeholder community, for civil society, for the non-governmental elements of the multi-stakeholder communities. And that is simply that any country that signs up must be agreeing also to expose itself, if you like, but agreeing to uh, peer review, particularly led by the multi-stakeholder community. So if a government signs up to maintaining and promoting human rights, ensuring equality online, then that immediately puts them into the spotlight of the multi-stakeholder community who can then say, actually, that is not the case. Now, lastly, I would just say that, of course, we do in that recognize that in some cases we want to have uh, countries that sign up who have an aspiration, who may not already be able to check box every single of the principles. But it is actually, that's why the multi-stakeholder role uh, is critical. It is to monitor, audit in a soft way, and also then give input again on the basis of multi-stakeholder consensus building as to how those principles must be given effect to in practice. So um, the fact that uh, one or other community is not asked to be a signatory alongside governments for the moment should not be seen in any way undervaluing or uh, seeking to um, push away uh, the communities and the processes which you control from the actual effective operation of this declaration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Piers. Uh, I think now we come to Tim, and I hope um, you can uh, make your interventions as brief. Tim? Uh, yes, I will, although I'm, uh, I want, there's a lot uh, that's been said. And I, first of all, really appreciate these questions. I think um, very thoughtful questions. Um, uh, it is uh, a good reminder of the importance of governments. Um, obviously, I represent the United States here in being uh, close to this process and, and, and understanding and, and hearing uh, as much as we can from from uh, from stakeholders. Um, yeah, I wanted to address uh, uh, some of the points that have been addressed. I, I uh, nonetheless, I wanted to get uh, uh, to some of them uh, in the beginning. First, you know, people have asked about the United States. I, I think and our um, commitment to these principles, and I think. Um, one of the goals of this is to uh, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. We, we think it's extremely important, um, uh, just speaking for the United States, that we uh, continue to adhere to these principles that we, and by signing this, are, are binding ourselves uh, in, 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 a, in a way that I think is very important. Um, I think all, uh, as I said before, I think one of the real challenges of the Internet, underestimated uh, at its, uh, in the early days, certainly in the 80s and the 90s, was um, the uh, influence of, of states and the relevance of, of state power and the use, as other panelists have said, uh, of, of the internet as an instrument of state power. And it is um, obviously something that's become increasingly uh, pressing and, you know, it's not um, uh, something to be taken. Uh, no one takes it lightly, so I won't say that. Uh, but the United States is committed, I'll, I'll say, is, is uh, I'll reannounce and restate what uh, Jake Sullivan in Prague, we're committed to these principles, and we're interested in showing that we're living these principles as well. You know, for just to take um, uh, one example, um, 
as some of you may know, President Biden uh, 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 back in um, October signed a, a new executive order enhancing safeguards for uh, signals intelligence activities, which is a, a range of uh, new protections for privacy data, civil liberty safeguards, which I think people care uh, very much about. Uh, this has to do with um, the data privacy uh, framework, but it's very it's it's important extra important because it is um, ensuring the U.S. government engages in intelligence activities around the world uh, in a way that is protecting citizens consistent with our values, and I think that's important and an example of the kind of thing we're doing to try to be adherent with the declaration. Um, we are uh, domestically. The president has repeatedly uh, said that he feels we need to do more in the government to control the power of some of the uh, largest uh, tech firms and um, uh, take a look at the immunities they enjoy that is consistent with um, some of the uh, claims or, or concerns that there is um, you know, too little attention to corporate power. It's certainly not uh, the approach of uh, this administration. I think we're very uh, concerned. I will also say that we are um, consistent with the idea that government should be trying to connect their citizens, uh, spending uh, billions of uh, dollars um, tens of billions of dollars uh, building up broadband in the United States in, the, uh, in a, yeah, an important fashion. And I also think that we um, need to encourage other countries and be um, uh, diligent in our efforts to, to fund efforts to connect the world. Um, so, you know, that's some of what we're doing on our side. Uh, there is more. I, I'd want to also acknowledge the role of the State Department uh, in this process and engaging in digital diplomacy and also the USAID, our aid organization. Uh, aid um, agency uh, in, in fulfilling these these uh, goals uh, overseas and engaging in the, the diplomacy. I, I want to uh, move beyond our uh, commitments and talk for a moment about this question of uh, fragmentation that was raised. Um, you know, one of the uh, someone asked, "Well, how is this consistent with?" Um, I think the document that think tank CFR, or I don't know if the, the Council on Foreign Relations wrote. And in some ways, I, I want to make clear this is the uh, the an important point uh, that uh, we wrote uh, the declaration, you know, the drafters of it believed that fragmentation was an increasingly serious problem and that, um, that this uh, declaration is a response to that uh, fragmentation. There's some people said, well, you know, it's going to, um, you know, create a, a us and them or or, or, or a, uh, you know, you're, you're a like-minded country or you're not. Uh, what we are trying, have been trying to do here, and I want to say we have had success. We've had um, uh, over half a dozen new countries sign up uh, this fall. Uh, we're close getting, you know, we're over 65 countries right now and growing. We want countries to reaffirm the basic values that are our commitment to a non-fragmented internet, uh, you know, to say, well, this is going to fragment the internet, in a sense, is uh, we're, we're dealing with a problem of an internet that's fragmenting. We're dealing with countries, uh, the things that everyone must acknowledge, are, are blocking um, a large amounts of content, um, using, um, shutting down the internet in certain instances, and, and you know, creating their own, um, their own uh, silos. And I, uh, we don't want the whole world to become like that. I don't think anyone here does, and that was is why it's a time to act and have countries reaffirm. That they believe in the basic principles that countries should be uh, interconnected with the open uh, the internet should be open and interoperable uh, secure and, and so forth so i think that's an important thing to understand that what we're trying to do here is react to an ongoing fragmentation that frankly could get worse it's already not like there's it's not like we're in the 90s and the internet is just started and everybody's interconnected by tcp ip there are significant fragmentations already and we need to take action uh, before it gets worse um, I want to close. I, I appreciate, um, you, you know, I, I um, am hearing that um, we, uh, uh, the members of multi-stakeholder society want to be more engaged, um, wish they had been involved in the drafting. I will say we had multiple sessions, you know, this always sounds a little defensive, but we met repeatedly uh, in the United States and Europe with, with multi-stakeholder uh, groups, previewed content and so forth. Um, but. Uh, I, I do think we can always do more uh, to have multi-stakeholders involved. Uh, the reason I think is already with, pre with preview that we centered this document on states is what we thought we were dealing with is a state problem. So in other words, um, you know, if you take your average multi-stakeholder, uh, you know, maybe a human rights organization, you know, they don't have a problem of, they're, they're not imprisoning dissidents or 
spying on people. So we don't need to bind you. I mean, it's good that you agree. I'm sure you agree with the principles, but we're you're sort of not our target uh, audience in terms of what uh, we want you to agree to. We we would, in some sense, I think most. Uh, but I, that said, I I think that we one of the ongoing challenges um, is exactly how we harness the power. Uh, Tim, I want to interrupt process. you. Uh, yes. Yeah, kindly uh, summarize because of time. Okay. Well, I will uh, just. I want to end on a different note and um, to say that um, finally, I think it uh, as we as we go forward and go um, uh, go forward with our diplomacy, I think it is extremely important that this we not take the attitude of like here's some great stuff we wrote and you know join us um, or um, you know, uh, you know that it, that not be that it that the the, the countries that um, are members of the of the declaration right now. Um, and I think, uh, in general, have to uh, make the case without just lecturing or um, trying to tell other countries what to do as to why it is so important for those of us who still believe that there is merits to an open internet to still believe that um, you know there, we can uh, have better economic development, cultural diversity. But we need to make the case. I, I think we need to um, make an economic case, and we need to do all we can. The burden is on in fact all of us to keep the internet strong and we can't have it something that becomes uh, 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 an example of you know, rich countries lecturing the rest of the world what to do. So I think we're very aware of that and we want to work very strong to try and create the incentives uh, to treat the internet as it should have been in return for founding values. Thank you very much, sorry for going over time. Okay, uh, Marek, are you, are you there? Uh, I will ask you to... Oh, yeah. Very, very brief, and because of time, uh, I'll also give you uh, the la you know the, uh, you'll be the first one to speak because we need to wind up because of time, and as we wind up, I would like you so you'll make your interventions, and then you will give us one key action, and that's not like a presentation. We just want you to to give us that key action in a tweet um, that is required. So if you're asked. What one key action would is required to ensure that the internet remains widely accessible, open, and human-centric, and why? So over to you, and then I'll come to you, Piers, and I'll and uh, team. You'll be the last one, and please, uh, it's it's just <laughs> very short, and then um, so Piers, and then uh, uh, and Riet. That's my alarm for saying we are almost, we need to finish. Should I go now? Sorry everyone, but uh, on my calendar it shows uh, 6.15. Okay, so we have time. All right, uh, then in that case, uh, uh, Marita, please just make your, your respond to the questions that were raised. Yeah, don't worry too much. Uh, feel free to come back to me later. I'll be very brief. And it's nice to see uh, familiar faces like Wolfgang. I don't think any multi-stakeholder meeting like the IGF is uh, complete without his presence. So it's great to see um, see him asking the question. So um, I'm trying to understand the dynamics a little bit and, and want to maybe invite you to look at it a certain way. The fact that not everybody was at the table uh, during the drafting process, and uh, by the way, I had nothing to do with drafting the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, so I don't own this and I don't have to defend this, but I'm trying to um, invite you to see it the following way. Just because not everybody was at the table doesn't mean you're not uh, allowed to be included now. I think this is the starting point of a process. That's also what I hear Tim saying and not the, the uh, end point. But I think it's important to appreciate the challenge of getting on board all the governments that have signed up. Um, I'm not sure that it would have happened, uh, as others have mentioned, with, with a long um, multi-stakeholder process. And I also think it's fair to say that a lot of the governments who have decided to sign up have not done enough themselves to protect an open and um, uh, global internet and to avoid fragmentation so far. So uh, it is, uh, as Tim said, important that they look themselves in the mirror and step up uh, where they may have failed uh, in the past. And I think it's important in general to avoid the following trap where there is 
uh, a sort of disqualification of any process that's not multi-stakeholder and to focus too much on process and too little on uh, results. And I think it's logical in some ways, and this goes to Izan's question, uh, that there is a, a number of countries that have signed up and that there are a number of countries that will probably never sign up because there are ideological differences. And I think it is important, if there's one thing that I would uh, urge you all to, to focus on, is to be explicit about the values <clears throat> and principles that are supposed to guide these many results that we would like to see. And that is inevitably going to exclude some people. It could be stakeholders, but it certainly will be governments. <clears throat> and so I think the, the silver lining here is that most countries that have committed to the declaration do respect the space for civil society. In fact, uh, support civil society, defend it when they come under pressure, uh, and therefore are hopefully uh, also open to other stakeholders like a free press, for example, uh, like voices from around the world and so on. So I think it's important to, to also see what is there, even if it might be implicit uh, in uh, the signatory signing up. And then the one call I would have for this community, and I think that the way to be involved in the most effective way is to hold these governments to account. Uh, let them act upon the commitments that they have now signed up to in principle. Uh, that's when we're going to really see results, not so much with signatures, but by implementing change policies and um, a true commitment to an open and global internet. And there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of accountability uh, to be ensured. So I see a huge amount of work for everyone at the table at the IGF, and I hope you will take on the task. Thanks. Uh, um, so I understand that, that there are um, there are questions, uh, comments uh, online, and I'm going to call on Sonia to give us those comments. Sonia. Yes. There is one question here um, from Jorge Campio. And uh, the question is very simple, and it says, how do initiators envisage the relation between the um, DFI and the global digital compact? Is that the only comment? Okay. Um, do you want to respond to that? Okay. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, if I may uh, give a, a brief answer from, from the perspective of the European Commission. Uh, just as I said, we're not building new in, um, uh, institutions or processes. We want to feed into the very important ones. So the DFI should uh, mean that when the global digital compact, in the way that we hope it will be framed and drafted, lands on the table of 170 plus countries in the UN, that uh, a very significant number of them will not be any way strangers to the principles that it should encapsulate. In other words, particularly with regard to issues such as internet shutdowns, respecting human rights, uh, uh, and of course, in improving digital literacy. These are issues which we hope will be central to the GDC. We know that the IGF will and should play a key role in that. And the DFI will, we hope, smooth the path to these becoming encapsulated in whatever comes out of the Global Digital Compact, particularly with regard to the, uh, the, the Leaders Summit in, in 2024. Thank you. Okay, I think we have just one, uh, we'll have an opportunity to ask one more question, one final question, if at all it is there. Anyone with it? Um, okay, so I don't see uh, any question. In that case, I'm going then to give it back to my panelists and um, ask each panelist to respond to this. If you are asked to identify one key action that is required to ensure the internet remains accessible, open, and human-centric, what would this action be and why? Uh, and so this time, I want to start on with our remote panelists. And I think the first uh, opportunity I want to give to Tim. Tim, are you there? I'm right here. Yep. So thank you uh, very much for that question. And again, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is appreciated by the United States government. Um, you know, we have, I know there's another panel uh, tomorrow. My um, 
uh, colleague uh, Alan Davidson of the NTIA will uh, be there. So we um, are uh, very uh, committed to this process and also, um, of course, you said earlier, uh, to the DFI. Um, so, you know, I, speaking from the perspective of the United States, I, I think I said earlier, what's the one thing? Um, I'll say it is uh, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. We feel strongly that the United States um, needs uh, to live up to the principles that we uh, declared in this thing. Uh, no country has been perfect, and um, we're aware of that, um, including ourselves. And we just think that's important uh, that we establish our, our, our credibility uh, in, on, on the world stage. Um, we uh, you know, have taken a, a, a great efforts um, over, over the course of this administration uh, to, uh, as I said, do some of the things that I talked about earlier in terms of trying to protect, uh, offer new privacy protections. We're working for other privacy protections. We're uh, trying to constrain um, uh, excesses of, of, of corporate power. And we want to um, be engaged with multi-stakeholder uh, process we want. Um, and we think, in fact, it is key. And this is, again, I return to this thing. We, uh, in the you know, earlier days, through many of the um, more uh, idealistic periods of the internet, we uh, presumed that uh, states, in some ways, were almost irrelevant. And we have um, seen that that uh, hasn't uh, worked out. And so I think uh, it is appropriate for the multi-stakeholders uh, community, it's already there to uh, some extent, but it's appropriate for us as well to focus on state behavior, both ourselves and around the world. And we have to promote, uh, and we want to promote a positive vision um, of, uh, of, of the future uh, of how the internet can, can be. I don't think it's uh, seen by everybody uh, that way. We can't take for granted that uh, people think there's something great here. Um, for those of us who still believe that um, despite some of the challenges, uh, that there, there, there is uh, uh, that the internet has much to offer this world, uh, that it can become a human and be a human-centered uh, source of economic development and uh, uh, cult cultural uh, richness. Um, we need, uh, I think, not to rest on our laurels to make the case uh, to uh, show that we're living, as I said, by the principles. To show the rest of the world uh, that they should want to abide by these principles as well, and not just assume that all this is taken for granted. So that's, um, I think, the kind of thinking that was behind the launch, um, you know, the original vision of why we need to have this. It was time, in some ways, um, to uh, bring back some of that, um, the ideals, but in a sense, with a greater sense and a greater uh, concern for uh, the risks, the dangers, and the realities of state power and action. So thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to be here. and. Um, well, everybody's attending. Okay, uh, Marietta, are you there? One key action? And My why? one key action. Yes, hello, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, my one key action would be to uh, appreciate the power of regulation and the need to see regulation to ensure that we move from principles to practice and real accountability. And when we get to that more sort of harder accountability and enshrining of principles in law, essentially, there will inevitably be a selection of those who agree and who will side with enshrining principles into law and those who will not. And I think that that will be a telling um, parting of ways, right? Uh, where it will actually become very clear who is willing to actually commit not only with signatures, but with laws uh, and, and who won't. And unfortunately, uh, it will not be a global coalition, uh, but it will hopefully be a majority of, um, of countries that will keep a door open, but that will also not wait for everybody to agree to take the necessary actions and ensure the, the uh, lacking accountability that we see at the moment. Thank you so much, uh, Andriette. Um, I think very important to continue this discussion about reclaiming the potential of, of the internet and to approach that from, from the point of view of principles. I think my key action would be to, to, in doing so, to remember that it's not the internet that needs to be regulated, it's the behavior of corporations, the behavior of states uh, and other non-state actors that needs to be targeted, regulated, changed, transformed, if we are going to reclaim that potential. 
So uh, this process has to trickle down to more than just another statement that sounds good and says important things. We have to implement that. And it's not at the level of regulating the internet as a whole, because that comes with a whole new set of risks that we want to avoid. Thank you. And finally, Piers. Thank you so much. Well, in, in, in highlighting what I would consider to be my one key action, I'm going to cheat because, in fact, there's a precursor to it that we have to also focus on. And, and, and with that, I'm, I'm very minded of what Henriette said in her first remarks, is that we have to, in trying to build an open rights-respecting internet, first of all, we have to have physical access to the internet for the world's population. So uh, all of our development agencies need to coordinate and, and, and uh, maximize the output working and partnering with com uh, countries so that uh, the internet infrastructure is built uh, according to their needs and, 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 and local uh, practices. So with that work going on, my one key action would then be to ensure that civil society and the non-governmental multi-stakeholder community is empowered and able to comment on um, without fear uh, of, uh, of, of attack uh, to comment on, but also positively advise governments in giving practical implementation of the principles which are set in the declaration. Thank you. Um, I think uh, you will all agree that uh, the conversations, the conversation we've had here has been very healthy, uh, has been very stimulating. Uh, people have been honest. We have raised issues that we think are critical to the success of the declaration. And these issues are very important because if we don't raise them, such issues undermine a good process. They undermine good documents. They undermine good intentions. So I'm not going to both uh, to summarize because I, there are too many points that came up and uh, I know that everyone has taken uh, you know, something with them out of this conversation. And so at this point, I just want to thank uh, Piers, I want to thank Henriette, uh, Tim, and Mariette for your very uh, well articulated uh, perspectives on the declaration. Uh, you know, your, your, your perspectives have actually enlightened more people have broken down what the declaration is all about and i think now we are more informed than we were before we came here i think we've also been able to raise our concerns which you have addressed so we are grateful to you uh, we are also very grateful to all of you who have come to listen and to raise questions we are grateful to the online uh, participants and to sonia for following on who is asking questions and even to organizers who are not here, like Anya, um, is it Anka, 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 and uh, Noha, uh, who have actually been organizing this and put this together. So thank you very much, and please allow me to feel the power of using this. So this session uh, stands adjourned.